uncomfortable. If we remove it, will it affect you? Or do you want it? Well, I, I'm not on too much near the end, aren't I? Am no. I? No, I, I've, I've just... I can, can I just take yeah. that off? Yeah, yeah. Because I don't like it. It's, it's really important, but it shouldn't be
Good morning, brothers and sisters. We now come to item 11 on our order paper, and this item is supported by three papers, GS2094A from the Dioceses of London and Truro, GS2094B from the Secretary General, and GSMISC1212, which provides an update since July. I also refer you to paragraphs 14 to 16 of the financial comment on the fifth notice paper. Now, this is the resumed debate on the Diocesan Synod motion on environmental programs that was adjourned at the July 2018 group of sessions. The original motion was jointly agreed between the Dioceses of London and Truro, both Diocesan Synods having passed motions in the same terms. The text in the agenda shows the motion as amended in July 2018 in the form it took immediately before the adjournment of the debate. Because of the lapse of time between the adjournment and this resumption now, I propose that Mrs. Enid Barron, the mover of the original motion, should be given the opportunity to speak again for five minutes to reintroduce the business. And as this is a joint Diocesan Synod motion, I also propose to allow the Reverend Andrew Yates of the Diocese of Truro to speak towards the end of the debate, prior to Mrs. Barron's formal response to the debate. I would also propose to call Canon John Spence to make a financial comment should he wish to do so. In order to do all this, Brothers and sisters, I need to seek the general consent of the Synod under Standing Order 21.3. Does this proposal have the Synod's general consent? Those in favour, please show. And those against. Thank you very much. Synod also needs to note that this item is followed by timed business at 11.30. I now call upon Mrs. Barron to speak. She has, Mrs. Barron, you have up to five minutes. Enid Barron, 350 London. Chair, thank you for calling me. Good morning, Synod. The motion we have here makes provisions to enable the Church of England to significantly step up its action on environmental issues, and especially in relation to climate change, which, as you know, is a very serious issue. It, it will enable the Church to meet its commitments for reducing CO2 emissions. And I think Synod recognised the threat and seriousness of climate change in that very passionate and lively debate we had on the TPI in July in York. I'm going to very re briefly run through the provisions of the motion. It looks a bit daunting on the agenda, but basically it provides action for the church to scale up its environmental work. By ensuring every diocese has an environmental program with a senior staff member as its leader and promoting communication and peer review, I must add here that the motion is not prescriptive about how dioceses achieve this and it does not ex suggest extra expenditure. That is entirely up to diocese. It is not called for in the motion. The motion all calls for the Environment Working Group, along with others such as the Mission and Public Affairs Group, to create a plan to promote, coordinate, and accelerate its environmental action, and to report on progress to Synod every three years so that we can keep an eye on what's happening. Another thing it provides is to measure this church's CO2 emissions so that we can check progress in relation to targets and thus also have the moral authority to influence others. The church can be a very effective ambassador for climate change and has influence way above its own actions if it acts correctly. You've heard from the chair that the motion was adjourned in July to a allow for assessment of the resources needed. 
And I want to tell you that that period of adjournment has been extremely helpful and positive because various things have happened which might not have happened before. So, for example, the Environmental Working Group with the Church's um, climate, um, Environment Campaign has drawn up a plan of action which is fully aligned with all five marks of mission and it is aimed at making substantial progress on environmental work, including reducing CO2 emissions. A proposal has been made, which would be funded centrally, to enter into something called an intelligent client service agreement with Historic England, which would enable practical advice to be given to parishes to help them take practical steps to reduce their carbon emissions, and in that way also save money. And an assessment has been made, as was promised, of the resources needed centrally to deliver the motion. Arrangements for measuring the church's CO2 emissions have been investigated in a very, very positive way and addressing the concerns raised last year. So that a system has now been devised which can use the existing statistics for mission annual returns with some modifications and cross-referencing those returns with other available data. This method, if this motion is passed, will be piloted before it's rolled out to the whole of the church, and it will, crucially for parishes, provide them with very helpful feedback individually. During the adjournment, Truro Diocese has made excellent use of the time by running its own experiment in measuring CO2 emissions. The results from this were very encouraging, Nearly half those contacted responded, and it took them between five and 20 minutes to reply. We're very grateful to Canon Spence and his team for time they spent on discussing resources. This was presented to the Archbishop's Council, and we gather that they regard um, the environment as a very high priority, but we'll hear more about that. I hope Synod will agree that the period of the adjournment has been put to good use, and will be able to give very strong support to this motion. I beg to move this motion on behalf of the Diocese of London. This item is now open for debate. The speech limit is five minutes. I call, first of all, the Bishop of Truro for a maiden speech and also Sophie Mitchell, one of our youth representatives from the Church of England Youth Council for her maiden speech. Thank you very much, Philip Mann Stephen, Diocese of Truro, number 41. And I am uh, honored to make this uh, maiden speech on a subject that's been close to my heart for many decades. And I'm delighted, therefore, that our Diocese of Truro is sharing this motion with London. I'm not going to get into the detail so much because we know who we find in the detail but rather urge us to keep the big picture. Climate change cannot be a matter of indifference for any of us, not least in Cornwall, where it is already having a significant impact on coastal communities, and where the main railway line to London was cut not so long ago by what would once have been described as a freak weather event, but the like of which is now all too common, thanks quite simply to climate change. I do not believe that we can underestimate the seriousness of this for our planet. In my previous role with Church Mission Society, I witnessed already marginal communities in northern Argentina living yet more marginal and precarious lives through flooding events of increasing severity, inundating the land on which they depend for their very survival. I witnessed two migrants being cared for from sub-Saharan Africa, forced to migrate, not only through conflict, but also, also through increased food insecurity caused by climate change. And behind the conflict, too, of course, there is so often the issue of ecological degradation destroying traditional ways of life. And who are the prophets of our age who are sounding the clearest warning about this? It is not, I fear, the Church of God. I suggest it is rather the school children who were out on the streets last week, children who were chided by senior politicians for doing so and patronized by political commentators for doing so. Well, I do not want to chide them nor patronize them. I want to say rather that I am 100%
with them. Behind this motion is a fundamental desire to see us as a church recover our prophetic edge. And for that to happen, I believe we need prophetic people to stir us up. People like our own environmental officer in Truro, someone whose purpose is not to chide, but rather to envision and to excite. Just, thus, just this last Monday, our environmental officer, Lucy Isaacson, took us to see the United Downs Deep Geothermal Project, which is tapping into the hot rocks beneath Cornwall. Amongst many, many superlatives that we can claim in Cornwall, we have the hottest rocks in the country <laughs> underneath our feet. Thank you very much. This will produce a clean, renewable, sustainable, and abundant power for years to come. And what's more, the, the project is wholly replicable, replicable across the county. Then again, we have ideas for using Glebeland to house batteries for electricity storage. The grid in the southwest is at capacity, so often wind turbines stand idle because there is simply nowhere for the generated electricity to go. But this idea of using Glebe would help Cornwall reach its target of 100% renewable energy by 2030 and generate income in the process. So what is not to like? But the point I want to make is that we would know nothing of the geothermal project and its very significant potential, nor of the idea for battery storage, if we did not have an environmental officer leading our, our environmental program who could not only point out what is already happening, but also open our eyes to potential and to possibilities. In other words, to play a truly prophetic role for us. So we as a church can play a prophetic role for the communities we are called to serve, awakening them in turn to significant potential and possibilities. And in turn, again, through such programs and people as a church, across our diocese, we can pool our imaginative potential to imagine a better and a more hopeful future for the whole country and the wider world. We can become, in other words, truly prophetic, which is surely what we are called to be. So I urge you to support our motion. And in closing, let me just briefly address the financial issues which it so often raises. Far too much of our debate, and indeed the wider debate about all this, has been framed around the question of whether we can afford to do this. But I want to say, how on earth do we think we can possibly afford not to? This is literally costing the earth. And at present, we are massively failing in our creation mandate to care for the planet, and we will be held liable before our God for doing so. So I urge us all to take this issue with the full seriousness it surely demands and to support this motion. Thank you very much. Sophie Mitchell, Sophie Mitchell followed by Prudence Daly. Thank you, Chair, for calling me. Sophie Mitchell, 483 Church of England Youth Council. On the 15th of February, thousands of young people left their classrooms and took to the streets to stand up for their futures. This protest took place in more than 60 towns and cities across the UK. Their protest slogan, so to say, was, we need change and we need it now. These young people demanded that the government should declare a climate emergency, therefore acknowledging the severity of this situation. I'm glad that this motion seeks for the Synod to recognise the escalating threat of climate change, and for so I urge you to vote in favour of this motion. However, I'm led to question how much change this will actually bring. What is required is not more documentation, but clear plans, clear actions and clear deadlines. It's not enough just to recognise that climate change is a threat to God's creation. We must understand that we are to blame for this and it's our responsibility to fix the problem. God's creation is a gift, one that we have been tasked with the stewarding of. However, we've so far failed to fulfill this duty to care for it. Do we really currently care about climate change enough to take, a, take it seriously and to make it a priority? The motion highlights a key achievement of the now 880 eco-churches and 18 eco-dioceses. Um, I'm proud to say that both my home diocese, Bristol, and my university diocese, 
Oh, sorry, my home diocese is Birmingham and my university diocese Bristol are a part of this. Um, but why have we not set a deadline for all our churches and all our dioceses to be eco-friendly? In fact, the only deadline that is suggested in this motion is that CO2 emissions will be reduced by 80% by 2020. Why are there no more deadlines? I believe this is the case because we're still not taking this issue seriously. This is the challenge of our generation. If you're hoping for this debate to go away, think again. This debate will continue for years to come, so it's time to start listening. In 2017, Archbishop Justin Welby reminded us that reducing the causes of climate change is essential to the life of faith. It is a way to love our neighbour and to steward the gift of creation. However, God's call to love one, of a, one another seems to have been lost on those in the generations to come. If your attitude towards climate change is indifferent, I urge you to think about your children and your grandchildren. These will be left with, to face the consequences of your decisions on climate change, both here today at Synod and in your everyday lives. The young people protesting earlier this month are engaged in the future of the world, and I invite you to engage in a similar way. Perhaps these young people care so much because they are conscious of having to live through more of the future compared to some of our voters here today. <laughs> or perhaps they care so much because they're more in tune with God's call for us to care for his creation. This is the model of faith and action that we should base our lives on. As I said, I urge you to vote in favour of this motion. But I also ask, please, pray diligently about your duty to protect God's creation and to change your attitudes about the lives of the generations to come. Thank you. Prudence Daly, followed by Canon John Spence. After Canon John Spence, I intend to reduce the speech limit to three minutes so we can hear as wide a range of voices as possible. Prudence Daly, 376 Oxford. Well, I'm going to say something that I've been wanting to say a long time about this, and that's that any effort and resources that we put into attempting to reduce climate change is going to be but the tiniest, tiniest drop in the ocean. This is a case of if we all do a little together, we'll do a little. As the Danish environmentalist Bjorn Lomborg has said, if all the ambitions of the Paris Climate Agreement were fulfilled um, at a cost of trillions of dollars a year, by the end of the century, we would have reduced um, global temperature by approximately 0.3 of a degree. Um, and that money could have been spent on projects that would have far more impact on the poorest in the world. And the fact is that even if the UK and all the other countries in the West um, succeeded in becoming carbon neutral, and we don't have any idea how we might do that, there would still be negligible effect because other countries which are developing rapidly, such as India and China, are pouring carbon dioxide into the atmosphere at an accelerating rate. And along with that has gone a, an unprecedented reduction in global poverty about which we hear very little, which is still continuing. And there's simply no mechanism for industrializing and reducing global poverty without generating car CO2 emissions. And we have no right to deny the poorest people in the world the basic standard of living, which we in the West regard as a basic human right. Um, now, to say that there are no easy solutions to this problem is not to deny that the problem exists or to say that it doesn't matter. Um, but the fact is that the solutions will be large-scale and they will be technological, including possibly the use of nuclear. We as a local church should quite rightly focus on the things that we can collectively and individually do um, to improve the environment. 
such as not pouring plastic into the oceans. You know, those kinds of realistic, sensible environmental programs are something that we should all espouse. But I just think we should not kid ourselves that the local church can do anything whatsoever about climate change. I think we just need to face up to reality and accept that that's not something we can do. And I know that there are members of Synod who agree with me because I've spoken to many of them. I suspect that they're all in the tea room at the moment and I would urge them please to come out and vote. And I would ask Synod to vote against this motion. Canon John Spence, followed by the Bishop of Salisbury. Uh, John Spence, 467 Archbishop's Council. Uh, global warming is indeed with us, and I'm feeling the need to cool things down after the contributions from the hot rock Bishop of Couturo and those, that red-hot contribution from Sophie as well as Prudence. We were grateful for the debate last July, and we were grateful for the agreement to adjourn. As Enid has said, that enabled us to get a much clearer handle on the sort of resource uh, uh, implications of the motion, and to engage, as Enid again has said with her and Andrew and the others, uh, very positively in trying to work out how best we could move forward together. It also enabled a full debate to take place at the Archbishop's Council meeting in January, where there was universal recognition of the issue and its importance, and universal support for that to be reflected in the prioritisation of our allocation of resource. As a result of that, Archbishop's Council has resolved, regardless of the outcome of this debate, uh, to procure a carbon footprint tool which will enable not only the aggregation of the Church of, the Church of England's uh, impact and carbon footprint across all church buildings to be measured and hopefully uh, trended downwards, but a tool which will also be of use at local level uh, in parishes and PCCs and benefices being able to identify exactly what their footprint is without a huge amount of marginal administrative work uh, and in order that they can actually get those financial savings as well as the environmental impact savings by managing their estate more effectively. We have agreed to procure some expert consul consultancy and we have agreed that we need to increase the amount of resource available in Church House to support the work going on at diocesan parish level. The exact increase, the exact nature of that increased resource and, uh, um, has yet to be absolutely calculated. Uh, the footprint tools will enable that individual or individuals to be more effective in any case. But shaping the exact amount is contingent on how we develop the budget for 2020, which is work now underway. But let's be very clear, uh, there are no individuals sitting around Church House uh, uh, with nothing to do. The debate yesterday on homelessness and the creation of a task force, however lean, and the work today on environment is work that we will accommodate. It will mean that we have to take resource from elsewhere or increase apportionment, so be it. We understand the will of Synod. And so we will create that resource that is our very clear commitment uh, because we understand the importance of the issue. I was very grateful that Sophie reminded us that this is about God's creation. We talk often about intergenerational, uh, intergenerational responsibilities. Surely there is nothing more apart from ensuring that the joy of Christ is brought to the heart of communities and individuals and generations to come. Surely the quality, the preservation and the stewardship of that wonderful creation matches that. I'm very happy to uh, say on behalf of Archbishop's Council, we recognize the motion. We cannot, Sophie, impose targets on parishes and dioceses. That is a local matter. Uh, but we will work with everyone to maximize the impact of this work in preserving the glory of God's creation. Uh, Nicholas Holden, Bishop of Salisbury, 36. Um, well, I'm really glad to follow Canon John Spence and to hear that encouraging news. There is something really interesting going on 
in Synod through this debate. Um, since we last met, since the motion was adjourned, some significant work has been done which has raised the game for us. But notice, please, that it has done so in response to diocesan motions from Truro and London, building on the work of the environmental working group set up by a motion from Southwark Diocese. Friends, this is happening because as a church, we are doing something bottom up. Actually, local churches are concerned about the care of God's creation, and we are bringing the matter to Synod and asking Synod and the Archbishop's Council to help us construct a framework which will allow us to respond in a way that has significance for church and world. The five marks of mission were adopted in the 1980s by the Anglican Communion, and those with long memories might remember that the fifth mark was an addition a couple of years after the first four. We sometimes think of it as, well, it's an extra, an addition, it would be nice if, but it is, of course, integral to all five marks of mission. You can't strive to safeguard the integrity of creation and sustain and renew the life of the earth if you aren't seeking peace and reconciliation, responding to human need, teaching, baptizing, and nurturing new believers, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom. It doesn't make sense in our day without doing that in terms of the care of God's creation. Young people get it. In the last five years, since the uh, Synod motion from Southwark Diocese, we have made enormous progress. The Transitions Pathway Initiative is world class in setting a framework that holds companies to account for their alignment with the Paris Agreement. The primates of the Anglican Communion have made it clear that the care of God's creation and the environment and global warming are a priority for the next Lambeth Conference in 2020. At home, the Church of England is doing amazing stuff on a shoestring. I was really grateful to the Bishop of Truro for highlighting the work of their DEO because she makes such a difference as somebody who is a paid resource. As a national church, we have less than half a full-time equivalent post to help us to do this. 1,200, over 1,200 churches are now engaged with Eco Church, over half the diocese. We're making great progress, but unless we put serious resource into this and the Archbishop's Council can deliver in the way Canon Spencer's encouraged, we risk ourselves not being aligned in the way we're asking others to be. Thank you. May I remind uh, members of Synod that the speech limit is now three minutes. I call uh, Prebendary Catherine Edmonds and Penny Allen. Catherine Edmonds, Exeter 117. This is my maiden speech. And when I looked at the um, sort of code of practice for Synod, uh, that it mentions something about in a speech you could have some humour. However, I don't think that this is a subject about which we can be humorous. It is an extremely important motion. I speak in support of the motion on the environmental programme. I have had recent experience of the disastrous consequences of global warming and climate change on the peoples of small island states in the South Pacific. I've witnessed the flooding of homes and churches and the loss of livelihoods in Melanesia, where islands have been completely destroyed by rising tides and changing weather patterns. Since returning from the Solomon Islands last July, which incidentally followed the Synod where the motion was adjourned, I have been contacted by the community of the Sisters of Melanesia, of which I am an associate, informing me of the destruction of their gardens by the recent unusually heavy storms, which have caused severe flooding. 
These gardens, as they refer to them, are their main supply of food for themselves and those whom they support. I could tell of numerous accounts of the harmful effects of rising sea levels, as even this week there have been reports that the Solomon Islands and Vanuatu have suffered severe consequences of a cyclone. There are many stories of these adverse and changing weather patterns which are affecting these small island states. When islands are being submerged, the local population has to move to higher ground, if that is possible on their islands, or relocate to neighboring islands, causing problems on that local population with severe social consequences. I encourage our diocese who have connections with these small island states to support them in whatever way they can, not least in gathering information from their partner dioceses and publicizing the effects that we in the Northern Hemisphere are having on those in the Southern Hemisphere. Our young people, as we've heard, have recently been moved to protest about the lack of action against climate change, attempting to elicit more action from the government. We in the church must show how we too are committed to those aims of shrinking our footprint and now the C of E environmental programme to be good stewards as we've heard so much of God's earth. And of course, the which was stated in the fifth mark of mission. And to provide resources as required. We must undertake the actions which this motion puts forward starting now. The effects are happening now. We have waited too long. We have deliberated too long. Now is the time to make a real difference. If our youth are moved to act, we must be ready to support them. I was struck by a placard held in the recent um, pupil demonstrations calling the government to be part of the solution, not the pollution. We too, as a church, must be part of the solution and ensure that our churches, church buildings and the whole church family are not part of the pollution. I hereby call on Synod to support this motion. Penny Allen, followed by Annika Matthews from the Church of England Youth Council. Penny Allen, Litchfield 335. I'm very pleased to support this motion from the Diocese of London and Truro, and I sometimes feel the long delays in dealing with diocesan motions leave the diocese concerned quite dispirited. On this occasion, it's been fruitful, but that's not always the case, and this first came forward in 2016. This is a mission initiative of the first order in line with the five marks of mission, as we have been reminded, and this is a national and international issue. Its focus is being heightened by David Attenborough and Prince William, among any, many others campaigning globally and nationally. And despite Donald Trump's state of denial, or perhaps because of him, the air we breathe is becoming warmer. This issue is particularly important to young people. We have all been reminded that school children and I am a retired teacher, were on the streets encouraging us to take this seriously. Members here will remember shrinking the footprint in 2006, the church and the earth in 2009. We need to be seen to be caring for more than God's acre. The proposals in this motion uh, currently do not involve huge significant costs. We are told that reprogramming to enable recording and reduction of energy will cost £10,000. We are told that £10,000 is needed to buy 25 days of consultancy time. We have already heard that an extra post may be required. This is in the fifth order paper. And Surely, surely, most diocese would support this. We all have environmental concerns of many types, 
and I hope, and thank you to John Spence for making this clear to us, this can be re actually supported centrally. I think it's very important that we take a resounding message back to our diocese that they can both move things through this general synod and that they are effective. Thank you. Annika Matthews, followed by Canon James Allison. Um, Annika Matthews, Synod number 481, Church of England Youth Council. Um, I haven't prepared a really great speech because I was actually kind of half thinking to speak, but um, Sophie kind of did that for us, I think, in terms of the urgency um, of this issue now for young people in particular, um, but about why it's really necessary to get on and do something about climate change. Um, but I felt more called to speak and stand up um, in relation to Prudence Daly's comments, actually, in terms of can the church actually really do something big about it? Um, I think it's about what we can do not what we can't do. Um, so my church, which I'm currently serving in in Manchester, um, has just become um, first urban church in the diocese to become an eco-church, gain an eco-church award. Um, they are working really hard to do lots of small things in terms of looking after the environment, um, in terms of recycling points. Um, they're setting up like a community garden. Um, they're gonna have an eco-fest um, in the summer time. Um, but I feel that lots of these things are really important and it's good to do them. But the church has a real impact in terms of raising awareness about climate change and that's something we all can do. But also, so in my church, um, the cura in particular is really passionate about this issue. Um, so she's uh, set up a um, eco group within the church where people can come to pray about these issues importantly and also debate how we can help um, spread that towards the general community, as this is really something, especially in the area of Manchester I'm in, which the general community are really behind about climate change. It's affecting all of us, not just Christians, but every single one of us in this world, regardless of faith or anything else. Um, in our community, there's a climate change action group. Um, people from my church have been able to go to that from the church to give a Christian perspective or just themselves show that Christians are interested in it. Um, in this issue and it's important to relate that um, to the community and I feel this is a real impact the church can have uh, in a positive way to connect everyone together in our society. Um, so I feel that lots have been said and I feel it's important to again reiterate the fact that we are all stewards of God's creation. God loves his world, has said he loves his world and he loves us, he loves the creation that we live in so I feel that we need to step up and love it back too. It's not about, it is about being passionate about it, but actually um, it's not something, the environment that I was hugely passionate about before, but it's necessary to get involved regardless of level of passion or interest as it's affecting all of us. It's as important as learning ABCs and maths in school. You may not like it, but it's something affecting us and will continue to affect us. So let's stand up now and act to sort this issue before it gets any worse for our world that we live in. Thank you. Canon James Allison followed by uh, Loretta Minghella, First Estates Commissioner. James Allison leads 132. Uh, correspondent from the dark satanic mills of Halifax. Not quite so dark, not quite so satanic. Do any of you remember November the 22nd last year? I remember it well because I was late for a diocesan environment committee. I was running very late, which wouldn't have been quite so bad, but if you go into an environment committee and you drive into the center of Leeds, you are frowned upon for not using public transport or walking or hiking or whatever it is you might have done to get there. That didn't make it a bad day, but November the 22nd was a really bad day because that was the day when the BBC announced that CO2 emissions had got so high that there was no going back. Whatever we did, it was too late to make a difference. I'd heard the report in the car, but it had washed over me like it probably washed over you. Whatever it did, it was too late to make a difference 
and I was too late for my meeting. But it had sunk into my meeting, and when I arrived late, they were already sunk into a deep despair. There was a series of cataclysmic prophecies, some I understood, sea levels rising, flash flooding in the valleys. I'd had that when I lived near Hebden Bridge, and the loss of life as we knew it. I was able to slink in at the back. Nobody noticed me arriving. And although I'm a spiritual director, what happened next was surprising. Because I distinctly heard God say to me, James, you need to say the word hope. Needless today to say, I did what any sensible spiritual director would do on this occasion. I ignored it. But as I heard people saying, how can we get people to listen? How can we get people to do something? Surely they will be afraid now and that will motivate them. I felt the voice say again, hope. And at that moment, the bishop looked at me and said, well, seeing as you've arrived late, you can do the prayers. And we'd like a word, please. I said, hope, let's pray. Nothing changed dramatically, but at that moment, the feel in our meeting was quite different. It was as though we discovered a superpower, that lots of things that we were saying that probably won't work, suddenly started, people started looking at each other and saying, but maybe with hope, something could happen. Something had changed. And I want to call upon you now to hear that word speaking, hope. We, above all people, need to be people who are people of hope, who throw out the net another time even though we've never caught fish before, who do things which are extraordinary because we have a God who is extraordinary with whom even the impossible is possible. I commend hope to you. I commend this report. Thank you. Loretta Minghella followed by Charles Reed. Loretta Minghella, ex officio 457, thank you. Um, let's be clear about where we stand in this battle because at the moment the world remains on course for catastrophic climate change. This is a problem all over the world but it's a biggest problem for the people who have done least to cause it, the poorest people in our world in the f most far-flung places and if we don't do what is necessary, we're going to need plan B. And the trouble with that is there's no plan B because there's no planet B. You asked us in the summer as the national investing bodies to get on with the job of persuading the companies that we invest in to do more, to align their business plans with the Paris Climate Agreement. You gave us quite a short deadline to work to for such an enormous task. Since we last saw you, we've moved Shell, we've moved BP, we've moved Exxon, we've moved Glencore. Congratulations to my colleagues at the Pensions Board and at the Church Commissioners who've done so much to move on this agenda. The timetable, thank you, they deserve that. The timetable can't just be demanding for them, it has to be demanding for us. We have to get our own house in order if we are going to stand up and call others to change. We can do more. I don't agree with somebody who spoke earlier to say that we can't affect this agenda. If it's not in our hands, who does it belong to? This is God's world, it's ours, our world but it's not ours to squander because we hold it on trust. And those of us who have industrialized on the back of the world's carbon, we have more to do, not less, in the fight against climate change. Yes, everybody in the world has a responsibility, but the world, what we say in international um, politics of this is that we have common but differentiated responsibilities and ours are greater. Friends, next year we will entertain our colleagues from around the Anglican Communion, many of them from the countries we know who are hardest hit. Will we tell them that we are leaving it to others to solve this problem, or will we say to them, across our church, we are doing everything we can? 
I think there's only one answer to that, and I ask you to support this motion. Thank you. Charles Reed, followed by Andrew Yates. Thank you. Uh, Charles Reed, 181 uh, Norwich. If you're playing Synod Bingo, this is your chance to uh, cross off the box that says, I did not intend to speak in this debate. Uh, but there are two reasons uh, why I did in the end want to speak. One is that uh, we have an environmental uh, working group, uh, but unfortunately, uh, through some technicalities, no member of that group is able to speak in this debate. Uh, but they tell me uh, that the Synod may like to know that they warmly, strongly support uh, this uh, motion and the implications of it, uh, particularly in terms of the resourcing that's needed. One of the things the Archbishop's Council may um, want to give some thought to is how practically uh, this can all be uh, resourced. This is uh, paragraph E of the motion. And that leads me to the second reason why I find in the end I want to speak in this debate, uh, which is uh, connected with uh, some of the things that Prudence uh, Daly uh, mentioned. Uh, one, one of my uh, favourite um, uh, 20th century uh, theologians, yes I am a bit geeky because I do have some favourite ones, it is Reinhold Niebuhr who was a North American Baptist theologian and I like Reinhold Niebuhr because he takes sin seriously uh, and in many of his writings he points out there are two sorts of sin into which human beings can lapse. One is the kind of sin that we're all too familiar with where we try to do things that we should not be doing and are beyond us but he also points out that there is another sort of sin where we are faced with a difficult problem, perhaps a large and complicated problem, and we throw up our hands and say, dear me, poor little me, what can I do? Uh, I won't make any difference. And he points out that that is also sin to abrogate our responsibilities. And it seems to me that looking at environmental issues is a very good example of that temptation to that second form of sin. Because uh, we are called to be stewards of creation right back in the creation stories in Genesis 2. And to abrogate that responsibility is sin. One thing that the Archbishop's Council might be able to do, therefore, is to act as a, a means of kind of clearing house of ideas of how we might be able to do small things that add up together to making a difference. For example, in my church in Mile Cross in the north end of Norwich, where I'm the associate priest, we have one Sunday a month where we don't print anything on paper, we have a paper-free Sunday. We've got the kind of building where you can project things on a screen and everybody can see because we don't really have pillars in our church. That's a very small thing, but those kind of things all adding up together can make a difference in the spirit of, uh, of Jane Johnson's uh, uh, urge uh, to hope. And I think a sharing of those good ideas uh, where we can learn from each other could be something that the Archbishop Council could do if they can facilitate that to help us make a difference so we do not abrogate our responsibility. Because, my friends, to abrogate responsibility is a sin of omission. Point of order, Mr. Freeman. I would welcome that very much, Mr. Freeman. Thank you. Andrew Yates. Andrew Yates, Diocese of Truro 231, and thank you, Chair, for bending the rules for allowing me to speak here. Of the many positive things that have happened at this Synod, I'd like to highlight two momentous moments. First, at around 6 o'clock on Wednesday evening, in the questions, when at number 18, Mark Sheard confirmed that the EWG plan we've heard about is firmly aligned to the five marks of mission, and not just a tag-on. And thank you, Bishop Nick, for emphasizing that in your speech. Crucially recognizing that it is missional and it is seeking justice that this ministry is about. The second moment was our very moving Eucharist here in this place yesterday morning, which showed that we can bring into our worship of God, our relationship to his creation in celebration in penitence and in song. Thank you to all those who contributed to this debate, particularly Sophie and Annika, for those that have spoken about the urgency of this matter. 
for those that have tried to answer prudence and say, yes, there are things that we can do. Thank you to Kate for talking about the impact elsewhere. Andrew spoke movingly about that underpass in his city yesterday. What I took away from July last year was the Loretta story of her visiting to India and the impact of flooding when she worked with Christian Aid. That had a similar impact on me. Thank you especially to all those who in this adjournment have worked so hard behind the scenes to make progress. To John Spence for willing to meet Enid and I and also for his commitment today. Thank you for all those who've contributed in that way. Particularly to Bishop, he's new, I've got to creep up to him. Um, your point about it's not what it cost, but what will it cost not to do it. One of the elements that Flora contributed to this motion is to encourage every diocese to have an environment program. So to get you ready for the vote in a moment, I'd like to have a bit of a practice and see how we're doing. So I'm going to ask you to raise your hand if your diocese does have a DEO or someone who looks after an environment program in your diocese. The voting starts now. I'd ask you to keep your hands up if you've had some direct contact with that person. And I will allow email as well. Thank you. Interesting as we look around. I think some of you might be a bit shy because 35 dioceses are supposed to have someone. Maybe you haven't woken up yet, I don't know. But perhaps there's something in that response about the challenge that we still face as a church. As we've heard, we have a partly funded Darson Environment Officer. Before she was on the scene, it was part of my brief, a wide portfolio of social responsibility. It was often a very lonely furrow. There were friends outside the church who got what I was talking about. There weren't so many colleagues within the church who were interested or recognized this as important. Can I ask everyone here, when they go home, to meet with their DEO, to give them some encouragement. They may take some time to reply, they're part-time, they're voluntary, but make contact with them, encourage and work with them to make this issue something important for our whole church. Thank you and I support this motion. I would welcome um, a motion that, that I would, has my consent. Uh, does it have the consent of Synod? Those in favour, please show. Those against? Thank you. I now call upon Mrs Barron to respond to the debate. Mrs Barron, you have up to five minutes. Thank you, Synod, for that really encouraging debate. Um, I'm going to be very quick because time is running out. And I want to thank all those people who've spoken and made many points in favour of this motion. But I want to do Prudence Daly the courtesy of responding to her call to oppose the motion. And I just want to say something about a few people not being able to make a difference. And ask if as Christians we would be here today if a handful of disciples who witnessed the resurrection had thought we can't make a difference. most of the points I wanted to make. I want this to be a good news headline for the church. We often get bad news headlines, but something like Church of England on front foot on climate change. Eco-granny votes for the climate. <laughs> <laughs> but the Bishop of Truro gave us a lovely one. Cornwall rocks. Hooray. <laughs> what more can I say? Much of what damages the planet is the result of sin. Good or bad old-fashioned sin. Greed, avarice, envy, lust for power, sloth. Need I go on? Uh, we've heard about a number of dioceses across the world in this synod who are really suffering. And what Prudence said about we must let the developing countries have their way, we're the problem, we've caused their problems, but it's those countries who are going to suffer most 
and we must help them by developing the clean technologies which will actually benefit them in so many ways. Think of the awful smogs and fogs in certain developing areas we can think about. God has provided a fantastic source of energy, it's called the sun. And from just a few solar panels on the Sahara Desert, we can actually provide all the world's energy forever. Um, I can't go into the technicalities. It's possible if we can transmit it and we can harness it. What more? Thank you so much for all who have spoken. I hope that if this synod votes strongly in favour of this motion, it will give more power to Canon Spence and others to ask for some more resources which I don't think need to be huge. The amount we need to spend in order to make a difference is not a lot. The whole thing we can do through this is, is missional, it's deeply embedded in the gospel and the outworking of God's love. Somebody referred to the Lambeth Conference. Do we want our archbishops to have to say to their brothers and sisters from across the globe, we have heard your pain, but so sorry, we can't afford to or spare the time to do anything about it. Tough. Or we do want them to say, we have heard your pain. We're doing all that we can with God's help to make a difference. And look, we're already doing something. Now is the time to act. The matter is urgent. I urge you, Synod, to support this motion. Thank you. Point of order, Mr. Scan. Let's go in London 358. Uh, Chair, I wonder if you would order a separate vote on paragraph E, which seems to me to be in, now entirely redundant and OTOs. We've been told that the uh, resources assessment has been done, uh, and it asks for a report back in February 2019, where we already are. So I think this motion would be greatly enhanced if uh, E were not part of it. Uh, and uh, so if we could have a separate vote on that, I would be very grateful. Thank you, Mr. Scown. Um, I'm not inclined to agree to that request. As, um, as you say, uh, we already have uh, many of the resources uh, published that this asks for, and I think that the intent of this clause, if not the exact detail, is clear. Point of order. Are 25 members standing to support that request? There are. This is a counted vote of the whole Synod. Those in favour should press one, those against should press two, those who wish to record an abstention should press three. voting period will end in 15 seconds. The voting, pe the voting period has ended.
results of the vote of the whole synod are in favor 279, against three, with four recorded abstentions. This motion is clearly carried. Thank you, Synod, for a very good debate. This concludes this item of business. Thank you. I really Thank you for your help. Well done. Nice. Synod, welcome to item 12 on our agenda. It's the first of a series of debates in this group of sessions that take us into the area of evangelism and discipleship. If I just set out how I'm proposing to take us through the process of the next 90 minutes or so. Uh, once the speaker has moved the initial motion, uh, we're going to have perhaps four speeches, five minutes each on the main motion. After that, I will invite each of the four proposers of amendments to speak to but not move their amendment and I'm going to cut them down to three minutes because we've got a lot of speakers wanting to engage. When they've each spoken to their amendments, we then got a bit of a shape about what the whole of the conversation is about. We'll go back for a bit more general debate. Then I'll ask each of the amenders to formally propose their amendment. We'll get a response from uh, the proposal of the main motion, but pretty limited debate on the amendments. None of them seem to require to me that very focused debate with lots of speeches just on the amendments. So we'll try and deal with the amendments in the middle section of this debate. Then I would hope that will give us a you know, 15, 20 minutes uh, back to general debate when we know what the final shape of the motion is about uh, before we come to uh, the original proposer responding to the whole debate and the final vote. So that's the broad way in which uh, Hopefully, with your um, approval and connivance, we shall get through this uh, debate. Far more people are put down to speak than we can possibly call, but we've we just had a good debate on the environment. I'm sure those of you who are not called this morning will be able to recycle your speeches for one of the subsequent debates before we get to <laughs> tomorrow afternoon. I therefore invite the Reverend Barry Hill to move item 12. Uh, Barry, you may speak for up to 10 minutes. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Hill Lester, 141, good morning. Uh, declaring an interest, I was a member of the Archbishop's Evangelism Task Group, am a member of the College of Evangelists and the Board of Thy Kingdom Come. Three weeks ago, for my daughter's birthday, we went to the sing-along version of The Greatest Showman. I appreciate it may not be the cup of tea of all Synod members, but for my 11-year-old daughter, for the 500 of us that packed into the Curve Theatre in Leicester, it was an evening full of joy and full of singing and a little bit of dancing, uh, and also an evening full of empathy as people evidently saw something of their stories reflected in the stories of those on the big screen. I guarantee 
Over the coming days, a good proportion of those that were there told others about the experience that they had had. We all witness, consciously and subconsciously, to dozens of things every day. We witness to stuff, the kind of clothes we wear, the kind of electronic devices we use during debates, no doubt just to take notes, the kind of cars we drive, the kind of wigs that we wear. We witness to stuff. We witness also to experiences. Have you tried that new restaurant, seen that film, read that book, been to that fringe meeting? Every day, we all witness to what is important to us, what we find helpful, and what makes a difference in our lives. We manage to do that for the parts of life which often are here one day and gone the next. How much more can we witness to, as the archbishops worded in their introduction to this report, in Jesus Christ, having received the very life of God. We're all here because others have witnessed to us of the joy, the life, the salvation and the hope freely offered to all in God. Friends, it would be scandalous if in a world of longing and need, others didn't have the same opportunities which we have had to lead lives of eternal purpose, saved from debilitating shame and guilt, saved from slavery and consumerism, a, a constant chasing after the wind. Lives set in meaningful Christian community, which for sure can be hard work, but as I'm reminded in the team of churches I serve in by those coming to faith, meaningful Christian community is a great blessing we often take for granted. We've had all of these opportunities and privileges because of two things and two things alone. God made it possible through Jesus Christ and someone somehow, somewhere showed, told or invited us. And yet the sharing of this hope and life is something which for most of us can be hard. I used to work in a diocese traveling around, training in evangelism and witness, and countless times encountered people for whom uh, sharing faith felt to have the same difficulty level as rebuilding the large Hadron Collider blindfolded in the dark. Whether because of fear, because of our history of imperialism, lack of practice and security or whatever, we have often made evangelism and witness rather complex. Little wonder some shy away or feel we need just one more training course before we give it a go. We have the opportunity over these four debates, the next two days, to reflect to our church that it is the joy and the calling of all. That in a specific Christian's network of family and friends, of classmates and colleagues, there is no one better placed in all of human history to witness to God's love than they. And that it isn't as hard as we think. To quote the Bishop of Chelmsford, it is about the overflow of the abundance of our hearts. Hence why worship and catechesis are central, building us up as disciples of Jesus Christ to share the good news. None of this is an encouragement to glib answers in a complex world, but as I spend time with those exploring faith, rarely I find they are drawn by the theologically perfect answer. Important though academic apologetics is, normally by a combination of being heard, so we listen first of being with, not just doing too, and by seeing often the messy reality of God at work in a person's life. There's no stock formula, there's no set form of words. We listen to God, we listen to context, we show, we tell. We announce that God has come near. As John Stott once said, most people in England are not Christians because they think it untrue, but because they feel it trivial. We are called to show this is the least trivial gift ever. National Mission and Evangelism Advisor Dr. Rachel Jordan reminds us that when people go to a hotel mostly these days, they don't first look at the brochures, they first go to TripAdvisor. If you like, we are TripAdvisors for Jesus. You can put that on a t-shirt. Or if you prefer Leslie Newbigin's words, the Christian community is the hermeneutic of the gospel. Slightly bigger t-shirt. Be fine for me. 
And that's what people see when they encounter any of the 33,000 church-supported ministries serving people in need. It's what they see when they encounter life events, baptisms, funerals, weddings. They encounter digital evangelism. It's what they see when someone invites them to find out more. And that's what these two reports before us are about. Not first structure and organization, but encouraging the baptismal call to all Christians as witnesses to the risen Christ in the power of his spirit in word and in deed. Evangelism doesn't belong to any one part of the church. We need all our church to reach all our nation. As Michael Green, great mentor and friend, encourager and model to so many of us wrote, if faith doesn't start with the individual, it doesn't start. But if it ends with the individual, it ends. So in that context, without repeating all that's in the reports before us, and mindful they are merely the tip of the iceberg of all God is doing in our diocese, our local churches, we've seen God bless a new global movement of prayer for evangelization thy kingdom come. Less than four years old, over millions of Christians, hundreds, over 100 countries, 60 plus denominations, not just praying generally, but pr praying specifically for five particular people to come to know Jesus. We've seen increased focus and resources to support witness by the whole people of God in setting God's people free, in chaplaincy, on housing estates, as we'll hear in the related debate later, with greater diversity, because that is at the center of our gospel and because it needs all Christians to reach all peoples, with young people and households, as we'll hear later and tomorrow, and with greater focus amongst those training for ordination. This didn't start with the evangelism task group and it doesn't finish with it. These now being taken forward in the formation, the priorities of the new evangelism discipleship team led by Dave Mayer. The work of the new team embodying four principles, handily all beginning in the same letter. Complementary to all that is going on because evangelism and witness is not an app which one runs on the operating system of church. It is at the core of our operating system. Concentrated not adding a myriad new things to burden down the local church, but doing a few things well to motivate the million regular worshippers. It's about congregations focused on Christians in local worshipping communities because we don't exist as individual religious consumers, but in community. The Brazilian theologian Leonardo Boff, writing of the Trinity, in the remotest beginning, communion prevails. And as we heard, it's about developing fourthly confidence. Not as expert answers to questions, but in our brokenness, one beggar offering another beggar gold. A wise person said, if our priorities do not shape our diaries, our diaries will shape our priorities. Most people struggle with time. It is instructive for us, therefore, in our archbishops, in our bishops, we have models of leaders, probably not overwhelmed with free time, but choosing to dedicate significant and increasing proportions of it to sharing faith. But as we know, England will not be converted by the clergy alone. Most people know a Christian, most don't know a bishop, uh, and most even don't know a vicar. We need to learn from the examples of the whole people of God, showing and telling what this looks like in workplaces, in schools, in homes, in hospitals. Clergy being those who cheer the saints on Monday to Saturday, not doing it all. God alone brings growth, but as we step out, he meets us, he shows us that he wants to, that he can, that he will, and as he draws people to us, so they respond in bringing their gifts, and we must therefore allow ourselves to be changed as a church by all they bring. So to conclude, the motion calls for each worshipping community to make evangelism a planned priority, to pray more because God alone gives growth, to reinforce and support this through the wider church. We live as 16,000 uh, churches and over a million regular worshippers amongst a society with deep longings for which we have hope and gift of hope in Jesus Christ. And in the days we're tempted to make, because we love the church and want it to continue, to make this about offering good news to others uh, as a survival mentality for the institution, we can repent because our motivation is not self-interest or survival. It is because we have a gift which God longs to offer to others and has chosen to use us in doing so. I move the motion, standing in my name.
Thank you. We will begin with Mrs. Alison Coulter. Then is the Reverend Andrew Lightbone standing for a maiden speech? He is over there. We'll take you second, Andrew. Alison Coulter, Winchester 425. I want to declare an interest as I was a member of the Evangelism Task Group, and so, of course, I highly recommend to you the report I've helped to write and hope Synod will be he'll able to give your full support to the motion before you. It's been a huge privilege to serve on the Evangelism Task Group. I hope my colleagues will agree that I've been a passionate proponent for lay witness and also making the link with the Setting God's People Free work and report. For this is indeed what we're setting God's people free for, to be confident witnesses to Jesus in the places and with the people where God has already put us. I shamelessly uh, took the quote from Michael Jenkins in the report from Bishop Rachel, who is our Episcopal champion for setting God's people free, because I love the image of all of us dripping our wet baptismal footprints around the places where we are, rather like uh, teenagers who've just come out of the bathroom, for those of you who have that experience. <laughs> and uh, perhaps more to some people's taste, Paul speaks about us taking the aroma of Christ with us wherever we go. And so I want to urge Synod to keep this at the heart of our thinking and work on evangelism. I have every confidence in Dave and his amazing team, but I know how easily things in our church become ossified and institutionalized. And evangelism is, is, evangelism is not something we can outsource to even the very best team in church house. We all need to be committed. So Dave, I urge you and your team to remember this and to continue to involve and challenge each of us. Thy Kingdom Come is a great tool to keep us focused. I learnt on the Evangelism Task Group from Bishop, Archbishop Justin not to use the word initiative. And evangelism is not an initiative. It is our way of life as witnesses to Jesus. I hope we'll approve the motion and make Thy Kingdom Come a priority for every parish. But we need to make sure this also doesn't become institutionalised and lose its life. I've already noticed, like a game of Chinese whispers, some confusion about what thy kingdom come is. I don't think it's a call to pray for the church or for the nation, although these are good and we should do this. I think it's a time for us to focus on praying for our witness as individual Christians called together by God to live in the world as we thought about in 1 Peter this morning. It's a chance to ask the Holy Spirit to continually fill and equip each of us as we remember how the Holy Spirit equipped the disciples on that first Pentecost. It's an opportunity, as Archbishop Justin has also said, to talk to Jesus about our friends before we talk to our friends about Jesus. It's not a Beacon Cathedral event, although I've certainly enjoyed the events at Winchester Cathedral. It is a moment for each Christian to pray and ask they will be effective in our witness. And I'm keen that this does not get lost as time goes by. I'm staying uh, in the Premier Inn at Waterloo, and I have this amazing view over Waterloo Station. I've been looking out of the window in the morning and thinking and praying for the people traveling into London to work, um, many from Winchester, I'm sure. And I want us to keep remembering in this chamber as well, the sent church as well as the gathered church. Please, Dave and your team, keep focusing on equipping and challenging those of us who are out in the workplace to be salt and light for Jesus every day. We need to encourage every person to pray for their witness. We can only be effective witnesses if we pray. And so I urge Synod members not only to vote for this motion, but also to set an example, to pray and encourage your friends and your brothers and sisters in your own churches to fully partake in thy kingdom come, to resist making it a church-focused event, but to encourage each person to pray the Holy Spirit to help and equip them to be the people Jesus calls us to be in all of our cities, towns and villages. Thank you. After Mr. Lightbound, the Bishop of Oxford, please. Thank you very much, Chair. And of course, mission and evangelism must be our priority. Archbishop William Temple said that the world needs more and better Christians. For me, that's a wonderful, pithy statement of the needs of the world. 
and Paul Bayes, Bishop of Liverpool, has recently written about a bigger church making a bigger difference. So growth is, I believe, important. Growth and difference and the ability to do things are directly correlated. So mission evangelism must indeed be a priority. But where to start? What, port, what sort of picture do we start with in our own mind's eye? I wonder if the work that we've produced is necessary, but perhaps just a little bit thin and can do with a lot of thickening out. What does the kingdom look like? What does the kingdom look like, not just for ourselves, but for society? What does thy kingdom really look like in the here and now, incarnate and real, for people who will both accept it and people who might be inclined to reject it? What is it that we are inviting people not just to accept, but to reject? Because there seems to me to be an awful lot of rejection of Jesus in the Bible. So I believe the work remains just a tad thin. It doesn't paint a picture for me of the vision glorious for society, for the kingdom of God on earth as in heaven. It doesn't in some ways discuss the very character of God. And I think it's ecclesiologically a little thin. What sort of church are we trying to be? Where does the energy from the church come from? Obviously, from prayer. What are the characteristics of the church? What is to be the public perception of the church for a group of people who aren't even looking in that direction at the present time? The church appears to me to be God's fact on earth, the body on earth. There's not enough for me about the church in this report. I worry that mission and evangelism is reducible to conversion. Is that all that mission and evangelism is? What does mission and evangelism mean in a multi-faith, multi-cultural context? What does mission and evangelism mean to the God-fearing Jew, Muslim, Hindu, or Sikh? Or does it just stop with the conversion of souls? What does mission and evangelism actually mean in many of our most challenging, diverse, plural contexts? I worry about all of these things and think they need to be fed into our work. Our approach to mission and evangelism needs thickening out. It needs to include conversion at its core, but not to be reducible to conversion. And I worry that that seems to be the case at the moment. I worry about what church we're trying to build. What does it say to the poor, to the disabled, to the gay, to the not sure, to the imprisoned, to the wealthy? What does it say to the Nicodemus and the Samaritan woman at the well? How does it speak into all of these contexts? What does it say? to people who are scared and wary of the body of Christ. These are missional questions and ecclesiological questions. They are questions we must answer as we thicken out our approach to mission and ministry and evangelism, always building a perception of the church which allows people to do one of two things, to accept or to reject, but never to remain in antipathy. Thank you. After the Bishop of Oxford, uh, <coughs> Canon Carol Wilson, home, please. Chair, thank you for calling me, Archbishop. Justin, thank you for your encouragement to speak and your uh, gentle plea for extra time. I need to declare an interest as one of the authors of the paper which uh, set up the task group and also one of my sons, Andy, was a member of the group. I think personally that they did a great job and thanks be to God. Synod, uh, we need to leave behind the idea, I hope, that evangelism and the passing on of faith 
in today's culture is easy or straightforward. It's very difficult. Technical solutions are inadequate for the spiritual challenge we face. Reminding the church continually of our decline simply saps our energy and morale. And pretending the solution is obvious when it clearly isn't undermines our confidence. The work of an evangelist in this moment, I think, is primarily the work of listening and asking questions and deep reflection on our culture. We need to recover the seven classical disciplines which have been at the heart of passing on the faith in every generation. Listening in prayer, love at the heart of our mission, apologetics, initial witness, catechesis, ecclesial formation, and forming new ecclesial communities. We need to set them the heart of Christian formation and ministerial formation. There are more details uh, on each in the article Archbishop Justin referenced on Wednesday. I want to focus what I have to say in this debate on our motivation and our vision to hand on the faith. What is it that sets our hearts on fire? I think we find our inspiration in two places. The first will be a deeper understanding of the needs of our culture. And the second will be catching a fresh vision of Christ and of Christ as the pattern for the church. We need to see the crowds as Jesus sees them, like sheep without a shepherd. The deep question of our age is without any doubt, what does it mean to be human? The question is asked of us by the environmental disaster we are living through, by rapid developments in technology, by the complete erosion of privacy by big tech, and by our popular culture. At either end of the spectrum, uh, I think the most significant book of this year will be Shoshana Zuboff's book, The Age of Surveillance Capitalism, which looks at the way technology mines our personalities for profit. At the other end of our culture, listen to the beautiful, brave, heartbreaking song by Jesse Glynn, I don't, wake, uh, I don't wear makeup on Thursdays, which she performed brilliantly at the Brits on Wednesday. We need to see and proclaim afresh in the face of that question, what does it mean to be human? We need to proclaim afresh that God came to live among us. The creator of the universe took flesh and became a human person who gave his life that we might live. What would it be like, I wonder, if we took as our guide to evangelism the Beatitudes of Matthew 5? Eight beautiful qualities which are a portrait of the character of Christ. They show us what God is like. They show us what it means to be human. They show us what it means to be the church. Our evangelism is meant to be poor in spirit, dependent on God's grace and God's witness uh, and God's spirit and witnessing to a life lived in relationship with God. Our evangelism is meant to weep with compassion and take seriously the suffering of the world held within the deeper context of God's joy. Our evangelism is to be meek and gentle like our savior, listening and modeling a different way to a world confused by power and treading softly with the frail and vulnerable. Our evangelism is meant to be hungry and thirsty for justice, like Jesus, and proclaiming the upside-down values of the kingdom in a world longing for fairness. Our evangelism should be clothed with mercy, practical love and service, but also carrying the good news of God's forgiveness and strong love to a fragile and fragmented world, much of which believes it has fallen short. Our evangelism should be pure in heart, offering a model of integrity because that is who Jesus is. We are offering fullness of life to a world hollowed out by chasing appearance or fame or fortune or afraid to show its real self. Synod, I hope each of these debates we will hold before us these key 
questions. I hope we'll take note of this report. I hope and pray. Thank you, Bishop. I Thank think you. we've got the point. Thank you. <laughs> After Canon uh, Carol Wilson, I've been looking for Father Thomas to speak to but not move his amendment. He will, and from then on, it will be a three minute speech limit. Carol. Carol Wilson Home 369 Newcastle. I do so very much welcome the convergence and congruence of thinking that's taking place and the evangelism task group and discipleship teams are coming together with setting God's people free. And particularly want to talk about the 12C objective, which speaks of encouraging dioceses to envisage, equip, and enable lay and ordained to be more confident in the sharing of the good news of Jesus Christ in our everyday lives. I want to make two points in support of how we might do that. The first is what would enable and dare I say excite lay people to be more confident in their discipleship. Well at a recent Setting God's People Free Learning event I was struck by how many dioceses have undertaken research to establish both what that might be and how they might do it. And research in my own diocese of Newcastle is certainly one of them um, that I, I want to speak about. We uh, did some research with lay and clergy and we've established a top, what I would call a top 10 list of what lay people say would help them be more confident. And within that list are things like to have a better understanding of the Bible, um, the skill of opening a conversation about faith, the opportunity to talk and share and learn together. None of them are rocket science and none of them ought to be too difficult to promulgate other than how do we do it. And the consultation in Newcastle on how do we do it includes pleas towards using e-learning and social media platforms as way of that learning and development. So my first plea to you is, to, will you stop us all um, inventing wheels and produce some good quality materials that can be delivered in all our dioceses in a variety of ways, emphasizing um, e-learning and uh, media, social media platforms as one of the ways of doing it. My second point is about what we include in the training of ordinands. It's nothing like a lay person telling you what ordinands should do. So for lay and clergy to work well together, I think we're bound through our mutual baptism as disciples. And to do that, the, to me, the leadership of our clergy is absolutely crucial to encourage and kickstart those lay people who are not feeling too confident. Um, so for me, one of the things I would like to say is, why can't we include team development, how teams function, team roles, facilitation skills, as core curriculum on all schemes? I think that would really kickstart uh, a change in culture in our churches. So we need you, Evangelism Task Group, evangelism, evangelism Discipleship Teams and Setting God's People Free. Please walk the talk with us, work together to develop materials, influence the training of ordinance, so that I think we really can and will accelerate that vision to motivate the million regular worshippers to pray, articulate, and live out our faith in the world. Thank you. So a reminder, the speech limit is now three minutes. Uh, Father Thomas to speak to but not yet move his amendment, after which if Dr. Andrew Bell will do the same with regard to his amendment, I'd be very grateful. Um, Father Thomas, um, Religious Communities 446. Um, my amendment is serves to make three points. Um, when I first read the report, I did have difficulty in really understanding what it was about. 
it's a good report, I'm not criticizing the report. When I've read it for the second time, I've realized that it's part of the phenomenon of our church that we all speak different dialects. I think we sh do share a common language, but our dialects are different. And sometimes that's churchmanship, sometimes it's other perspectives. And there is, I think, a risk that many people who are at home in the dialect I speak, I speak um, uh, can not feel, um, uh, feel, feel it hard to understand the dialect in which this kind of report um, is made. And the difference in the dialect um, is not so much about whether evangelism is a good thing or not, um, but it's about where evangelism, where the stress comes in relation to evangelism and worship. Um, I understand the dialect in which this report is written, that it starts with evangelism. And then worship, also important, is the second. Now, I think in the dialect I speak, worship comes first and evangelism second. And so the, my amendment wants to um, relate, um, to draw in, I hope, um, people who speak my dialect into the conversation. I think our dialects are mutually intelligible by and large, but as with all dialects, um, you can only say some things in one dialect, and in others, it's hard to say things. Um, get somebody who speaks Geordie um, uh, trying to understand somebody who speaks Scouse, and you'll understand what I mean. Um, um, one of the things about worship, the importance of worship for people like me, and I recognize that worship is vitally important for all of us, is that it's understood as a, pri a place where not only Christ, not only the Spirit, not only time, um, not only the people there are involved, but a far greater reality. And it seems to me that many people who are among that middle third to which the report uh, makes reference at um, uh, paragraph 12, I think it is, um, are in, um, they have, we have perhaps for, taken for granted some of the things which happen in that worship. And I really do think that to engage with evangelism, one needs to engage with the mysteries, the deep mystery uh, which is given to us in our ordered worship. And I think that's, the, that's what my amendment is about. Thank you, Thomas. Thank you. I think Dr. Bell has the shortest amendment I've ever had to chair. <laughs> I, I think you'll, you'll get 90 seconds per word at this, at this rate. <laughs> After that, we were due to have Lisa Batty moving her amendment. I'm told that Canon Lisa Batty is unwell, but that Jacqueline Stamper has agreed to speak to the amendment on her behalf, and that that is in order. So after Dr. Andrew Bell, again, speaking to but not moving his amendment, if Jacqueline Stamper would speak to but not move the third amendment. Thank you. Andrew Bell, Oxford 374. Um, yes, I thoroughly welcome the emphasis on evangelism at this group of sessions, and I thoroughly support this motion. Um, as the chair has already said, my amendment must be one of the shortest to come to Synod, adding just two words, and I hope it's also one of the least contentious. When I read GS 2118 and saw this motion, particularly the call to make evangelism a planned priority for the coming year, my immediate thought was, why just for this year? Surely evangelism must always be a priority. Calling people to repentance, faith, new birth, and discipleship is what the church is for. It's the great commission that Jesus gave us. We've previously been encouraged that evangelism should be a standing agenda item on every agenda from PCC upwards and should drive all other agenda items. Yes, finance and everything. That surely makes sense if we really believe evangelism is what we're here for, as it is and as Barry and other speakers have emphasized. So my initial thought for this amendment was simply to delete for the coming year. But in discussion with Barry and those who put together the motion, I can see the point of those words. 
that it needs to be a priority now, not next year or in five years' time when we've talked about it some more. So I propose we simply add two words, emphasizing that evangelism should be our priority in the coming year and always. I trust that this will be seen as an entirely friendly and un uncontroversial amendment. Thank you. After Jacqueline Stamper, if the Reverend Stuart Fife would also speak to but not move his amendment. Um, Jacqueline Stamper, Blackburn 257, speaking on behalf of Lisa Batty, Manchester 169. Uh, Lisa has given me the words she would have used had she not been uh, taken on, uh, ill. This motion is so important at this time that we need to give it every chance of becoming an effective catalyst for growth in depth and numbers of those whom God is calling to faith in Jesus. To do that, I believe we need to keep the work of new, nurturing new disciples close to that of evangelism from the start. And at the same time as calling for evangelism to be a priority, to call for a shift in how we use clergy time that will make evangelism more effective in the long term. We all know that many Anglican clergy are not natural evangelists, but surely one of the key purposes for training our clergy is so that they can take a lead in passing on the faith through teaching it to them who are learning it. And yet, with clergy increasingly overseeing multiple congregations, the pressure on them is simply to keep the show on the road and delegate work with people, such as provision of confirmation classes, to differently qualified people in order that they, the clergy, have time to sit in committees or perform tasks that other church members could be set free to give to the work of maintaining things. Freeing clergy to support evangelism in the way that they are particularly prepared for will require a culture shift in our churches. And that is why I'm asking that we make this explicit within this motion from the outset. I urge you to support this motion and this amendment. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Uh, Stuart Fife then to speak to but not move uh, his amendment, and then back a little bit more general debate, and perhaps Sir Philip Priming next. Stuart Fife, Carlisle 079. Thank you, Chair. I am the most reluctant amender of emotions, and I intend this as the friendliest of amendments uh, to bless this motion by making it clear that we are not speaking only to the church, nor is our task merely about church growth. Uh, we also want to address the nation and to reclaim a confidence in Christian mission as a valuable contributor to our national life. Uh, for much of my early life, Christian mission was seen, even by non-churchgoers, as an intrinsically good thing. Uh, these days, sadly, it's often seen as a rather shady business, scalp hunting, manipulative, and self-serving. And if that's an unfair characterization of what we believe we're doing, we also have to acknowledge that we are partly responsible for that misconception. Uh, we have too often approached evangelism with an overtone of arrogance, and we must be seen to have repented of that arrogance. So it's all the more important that we avoid giving the inadvertent impression that evangelism is about empire building. Uh, my amendment seeks, I think, to address some of the concerns raised by Andrew Lightbound in his speech and to ensure that we, as the national church, engage with the nation, to make it clear that we're seeking to make a positive contribution to our national life. Uh, we are offering hope to a nation in these difficult times because we ourselves are broken, yet transformed by the resurrected Christ. We are living embodiments of good news received by the poor. Uh, yesterday, I had the privilege to hear the story of Sid, the son of Synod member Giles Williams. Uh, he told me of his work with the Message Trust, running a, a bus as a mobile youth centre in Anfield. Their approach was flagrant. They preached the gospel, invited people to faith, and discipled them in it. And after a little while, the police came to them and offered them money to run a gang intervention project. 
you do realize, he said, that all we do is tell people about Jesus. Well, do you have to do that? Yes, because it transforms lives. So they ended up being paid to do evangelism by the police. And at the end of the project, crime in the area had been reduced by half. It speaks volumes about communities being transformed by encountering the living word of God in the person of Jesus. Above all, it's a story I can testify to in my own life. Having come to the uh, faith at the age of 17, it has rescued me from a life of terrible depression and gloom. It hasn't prevented me from making stupid mistakes, but it's rescued me over and over again, most notably saving my marriage and my family life. Why, brothers and sisters, why, when we are so broken, do such amazing things happen when we are around? Because we embody what it is for humanity to encounter the living word of God, to be recreated in the image of our creator, the amazing triune God of love. My amendment is about saying to the nation, we want to come to talk to you about this, not to grow the church, but because we care about you, because coming to know Jesus transforms lives, families, and communities. It's the greatest joy we can offer. Thank you. After Philip Plimming, the Bishop of Leicester, please. Thank you, Chair. Philip Plimming, Universities and TIs 453. I want, in welcoming the report, and indeed all four amendments, to comment specifically on the selection and training in the area of evangelism witness, something which is dealt with at priority six in the report. And I'm speaking from the perspective of someone who is currently teaching mission and evangelism to all the first-year ordinance at Cranmore Hall, where I serve. I also teach leadership, and I'm glad to assure Carol Wollstenholme that we do talk and teach on leading and developing teams. But I want to make two points. First of all, I'm happy to reassure Synod that training in the practical skills of witness and evangelism is already part of the general curriculum within the TEI sector. The students I've been working with have been developing expertise in understanding the different contexts in which we seek to witness, learning how to tell our own story of faith in such a way as to point to Christ, and leading people to make a faith commitment for themselves. All students were part of a Faith Sharing Weekend team working in different churches and contexts throughout the Northeast just a few weekends ago. <laughs> Second, however, I would contend that the most important thing we can teach ordinands is not the technique of witness in evangelism, valuable though it is, but the theology behind evangelism itself. I'm a passionate believer that good theology feeds good mission and evangelism. And it is theological insight, deeply explored and deeply held, that will cause our hearts to burn for evangelism and witness. It is theology that will remind us that for all the value of modeling the good news, we are also called to proclaim the good news of God. From Isaiah, I will tell of the kindnesses of the Lord, the deeds for which he is to be praised. To Jesus in conversation with the demon-possessed man, go home and tell them how much the Lord has done for you. We hear the language of proclamation, language reflected in the five marks of mission. Theology reminds us of the value of presence, of serving, of listening, and yes, with all gentleness and humility, of proclaiming. It's also theology that will refresh us with confidence in the gospel itself. The good news of Jesus is indeed like the multifaceted diamond which both sparkles at first sight and becomes ever more beautiful on closer inspection. Putting down deep theological roots means we see how Jesus, in both, his, in both his challenge and his comfort, is good news in a changing and complex world. Crucified and risen Christ, absolutely, but incarnate Christ, ascended Christ, returning Christ, and reigning Christ. Good news to us and the world. Evangelism is, evangelism is not a church survival strategy. It is not a set of techniques designed to get more people to buy the product. Evangelism is ultimately a theological activity, and it is that great task with which TIs are engaged and which will fire our church with the spirit-filled mission. Thank you. After the Bishop of Leicester, I'm going to invite Father Thomas to formally move his amendment. Martin Snow, Leicester 23. I very warmly welcome this report. I'm really pleased that Synod is spending time thinking about how best to share the joy of the gospel. I want to make a plea within the report for a greater focus on receiving the gift of the evangelist. 
Like some other bishops, I've taken time over the past year to spend long weekends in particular parishes with a group of curates and ordinands, and my one request to the incumbency in organizing our visit has been to make sure we spend time with people who don't come to church rather than those who do. Not only do I find myself extraordinarily energized by these weekends, but I've found that clergy and congregations alike have been energized and inspired for what we in Leicester now call everyday faith conversations. One incumbent wrote to me to say that as a result of the visit, the landlords of the local pub had invited the church to start a weekly gathering in the pub. The landlords who were not Christians themselves liked the idea of their pub being a place where people could explore questions of faith. So I'd never really thought of myself as an evangelist until recently. But now I find that not only do I love these everyday faith conversations, but the more I do it, the more others around me also seem to grow in confidence that they too can have such conversations. Evangelists then are a gift to the church. Their role is not to do evangelism so others don't have to, but rather to equip all the saints to witness to God's kingdom. That's why I applaud the aim of identifying and equipping and releasing a thousand new evangelists of all ages and traditions. We need more evangelists because their gift to the church is precisely in the area of equipping every person to be a witness. And today's evangelists will not be lone rangers. Today's evangelists will not be loud extroverts who frighten everyone with their enthusiasm. The evangelists of today need to be team members who mentor and coach others in everyday faith conversations, helping people overcome their anxiety, helping them think through the tough questions that anyone who publicly owns the name Christian will get asked, and helping people grow in prayerfulness and compassion. I count it a great privilege now to chair the Archbishop's College of Evangelists. For 20 years, this college has been supporting evangelists across the country. I hope and pray that the church will raise up many more evangelists. Thank you, Synod. We're coming on now to um, dealing with the various amendments. Uh, each of the proposed amendments, they'll in turn, as we do them separately, be invited to come and say the three magic words, I so move. After that debate, uh, after that, I will invite Barry Hill to say whether he supports or resists the amendment. If he resists, we go to the 25 member rule. If he supports, debate opens, but as these, if the amendments are not contentious, I'd, I'd first look to anybody who wants to oppose such an amendment. If there is no opposition to a particular amendment, I don't think I want to trouble us with hearing speeches in favour of it, or we'd rather have as much time as possible on the main substantive motion. So at that time, proposing to deal with each one in turn. So if, you, if you're really against one of these amendments, this is your big moment is going to come very shortly. Father Thomas, over to um, you. I move my amendment. Thank you. Uh, Barry, would you like to comment? I'll, um, I'll restrain myself, I think, with all four amendments because I think all four are friendly, so I'll, I'll uh, keep brief because I'm conscious to give as much time for uh, other members to share their experience as possible. Uh, very welcome. I think the point on, on dialect uh, is, uh, is really critical. The gospel is always spoken in our mother tongue, in our native dialect. Um, the point of, uh, of starting with worship, which certainly we felt as a group, um, uh, I think brings uh, Father Thomas your motion uh, much more clearly into the uh, motion uh, and would support it. Our witness welling up out of that deep life-giving wells of uh, worship um, uh, put beautifully, I think, if you haven't read, those calling for a thickening out for evangelism. Pope Francis's wonderful encyclical on the joy of evangelism, which takes worship as its uh, starting point. Um, I think all our days do is finish with the words we say every day, O oh Lord, open our lips. And we responded with true Anglican mumbling. <laughs> <laughs> Would anybody wish to stand to oppose this amendment? Oh, Tim. Two minutes, Tim. Tim Hine, 247 Bath and Wells. 
I want to oppose this amendment because I don't think it actually adds anything to the th general thrust of what we're talking about. And uh, it may, may actually uh, detract a little. Uh, in Bath and Wells, we already have a priority of putting mission and evangelism at the heart of everything we do. And I think this is a timeline issue. I think worship is an absolutely key resource for those that want to engage in evangelism. But it's not the only resource. And I want to keep the focus on evangelism. And therefore, I would resist this particular uh, um, motion. I would just like to say in, um, in Andrew's um, concern, concern for the length of his amendment later, we did have a, an hour and a half talking about EC some years ago. Um, we did have one amendment which was about a single letter when we were talking about marriage and asking whether or not it should be forsaking all other or forsaking all others. So don't worry about the length of the amendment. I'm sure that that won't, won't be a problem. You were showing your age there, remembering Eck. Do we have anyone who wants to support this amendment, to speak in support of the amendment? Sir, two minutes again, after which I will be um, tempting you with a motion to close. You were losing your way, Ed. In many ways in life. Right. Uh, Ed Shaw, 260 Bristol. Um, I suspect I'll be seen as speaking with a different dialect uh, to Father Thomas. We certainly dress differently, but I do want to support his amendment. Um, I'm part of a BMO in the centre of Bristol, average age 25. But we found recently, as we seek to keep evangelism a priority, we need to do what this amendment urges us to do, which is make sure that we don't seek to discourage people into evangelism by just beating them over the head with all the stats that can easily discourage us all. But instead, we seek to encourage people by presenting the Lord Jesus to them. On a recent weekend away, entitled Sharing Jesus, titled Nick from the Archbishop of Canterbury's website, um, what we did was basically spend our time talking about Jesus. We wanted evangelism to be the result, but the way that we sought to do that was by focusing on Jesus in word and sacrament, praising and praying to Jesus. And it's out of that worship and experience and reminder of all that he has done for us that evangelism comes. And as a result, that is why I would hardly support this amendment. And as I see no one standing, we can go straight to uh, a vote on this item. Uh, we're voting on item 42, which is the amendment that stands in Father Thomas's, Thomas Seville's name. Those in favour, please show. Thank you. Those against, please show. Thank you. That is clearly carried. We move on to the second amendment in Dr. Andrew Bell's name. Again, the three magic words. My amendment. Four words. Do we have anybody who wishes to speak in opposition to this amendment? As we don't, um, may I, well, is anybody, oh, I needed to ask whether, um, Barry, you support this. I'm sorry, I was uh, getting ahead of myself there. Barry Hill, do you support these two little words? Uh, I do, uh, uh, yes. And I think I'll just add uh, the quote of uh, J.C. Ryle on John's Gospel. Terrifically urgent, but never in a hurry. And how we embody that sense that the need is urgent, we see that in our parishes every week, every day, and yet we're not anxiety-ridden in hurry. So this coming year, and always, at least until our Lord returns. So thank you. So this is now item 43, but as I see nobody standing, I'm going to put item 43 to the vote. Those in favour, please show. Thank you. Those against, please show. That too is clearly carried. Item 44, Jacqueline. I move the amendment standing in Lisa Batty's name. Thank you. Barry? Just going to send a tiny bit extra here because the stats team uh, helpfully gave us some data just a few days ago that I thought Synod would want to hear in relation to this. That uh, from annual returns last year, when we averaged that across the year, in the four days that we're meeting now as Synod, 350 people have joined our Anglican churches who have never previously been part of any Christian church. 
another 130 have returned to faith in our churches. That's 480 people over these four days alone. And so how is the, the nurturing, the disciple, the learning from uh, uh, reflected in the diaries, not just of the clergy, but of the whole people of God, I think is a, a very helpful challenge. I'm grateful to, to Canon Lisa and to Jacqueline for moving. We do support. Thank you. So this is, again, open for debate. If anyone would like to oppose this amendment, I'd like to see that first. So, and then I'll take a speech in favour of it if there is one. Two minutes, still the limit. Uh, Ian Yem, Bristol 261. Uh, I would ask you to resist this amendment on the basis that it emphasises something uh, that for me is counterintuitive to 12C, which states about equipping and enabling lay and ordained people to be more confident in sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. It puts the emphasis obliquely on the clergy, and I think that that is something that I would like to avoid. If this is about collaboration and partnership, most of my Christian life has been developed by discipling of the whole people of God, and I just think it takes us in the wrong direction by overemphasizing the role of the clergy, important as that is. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Canon Paver. I'm rather, uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm rather um, confused, and I think there may be other people confused by this particular amendment, because I think it's open to misinterpretation. And the clause within it that worries me is about our existing communities. They are the garden in which we're inviting people to come and join us in joy and worship. And uh, when we send out uh, a motion passed by this synod into our parishes and into our di dioceses and deaneries, I think we have to be very clear what we're actually saying. So it does, um, I think as well, with setting God's people free, we're all as one, are we not, uh, in this evangelizing of the whole nation. But I, I'm just a little concerned that in identifying our current communities in this way, uh, it may well be seen by those who don't have the privilege of hearing all the debate and reading all the papers that we do, and it is a privilege, then it might uh, be open to misinterpretation. I just leave it to Synod. Thank you. I'd like to hear somebody who wishes to speak in favour of the amendment. Margaret, is that you? Margaret Swinson, Liverpool 348. Um, I don't have any kind of issue with this uh, as undermining the laity. I think it absolutely, in some ways, does the opposite. It's very easy for us in our churches to expect the vicar to look after us. There are a lot of people who still expect the vicar. This is about us saying, actually, how do we want our vicars, our clergy, to be using their time? Our laity are there and can also do that looking after the current existing uh, church communities. Our clergy are a scarce resource. We must think carefully how we use them. And in building and discipling new Christians, that's a really good way to be using them. This is also a warning to the rest of us not to expect them to be looking after us. We must look after one another. Clergy and laity look after one another, but we must absolutely use our scarce resource where it is most needed, and that is, at the moment, in the discipling and nurturing of those people who are coming anew to our churches. Thank you. Uh, Pro locutor, then I will be looking to close this particular amendment. Simon about the Southwark uh, 219, I'd like to oppose this amendment as well, uh, partly because it's vague in its wording. Uh, the other day I uh, was uh, uh, on a Facebook exchange about the words motivating the million, and some rather sniffy clergyman said, well, what about converting the million in the first place? I think the point being is that actually if we are going to focus on the discipling of new Christians, we need to ensure the people of God are equipped to do that. And in my context, that focus needs to begin with nurturing and encouraging 
the people of God I have, because they will be the evangelists. That's what this focus is on. I think this is a false dichotomy between two things that are both essential in the same uh, process, and it's shifting the weight in the wrong direction. I'd ask you to reject it. Thank you. As I see nobody else standing, I'm going to put item 44 oh. yep. to the vote. Thank you. Uh, those in favor, please show. Those against, please show. That is clearly lost, which brings us on to uh, Reverend Stuart Fyth's amendment. I do so move. Thank you. Barry, a comment? Again, see this is friendly and happy to support. Um, I think the sense particularly of this being for the common good, Stuart, which we're grateful, uh, this is an empire building. We don't do this. In fact, we should give ourselves up as church if for the sake of the other. We shouldn't expect them to uh, add to our weight, if you like. Um, and I think the, the, the sense that Jesus didn't see a body or a soul, he saw a holistic person, an evangelism, a witness, integral to all our different dimensions of mission, um, uh, uh, holistic evangelism, uh, uh, being um, so critical. So uh, very happy to support. Thank you. So uh, once again, open for debate, but the, I'd like to hear first from if there's any opposition to this amendment. As I'm not seeing anybody standing, um, I'm minded then that we, that we go straight to a vote on this, as there's still nobody standing to resist that. Uh, we now move to vote on item 45. Those in favor, please show. Thank you. Those against, please show. That also is clearly carried. Can I thank you all for having uh, dealt with the amendment? So we now have the final version of this uh, as we'll be voting on it, uh, including 42, 43, and 45, but not 44. We go back to the main debate. The speech limit reverts to three minutes, and the Archbishop of Canterbury is standing. As we uh, come to the final stages of this debate, I want to return to the link between evangelism and discipleship. Bishop Stephen, again, of Oxford, put this very, very clearly when he spoke the, of the fact that evangelism looks at the needs of the culture and the vision of Christ, that we need to see the world as Christ sees it. It means discipleship and evangelism are at the foundation of Christian life. They come inextricably together. They're not activities for some, let alone an elite or a part of the church, but they spring from compassion and love in the depths of our hearts from our own experience and knowledge of Christ. And that means discipleship and evangelism demand change in us. And if we support this motion, which it looks as though we will, we are also committing to very radical change. It's not one thing among many, but it is an overwhelming force that directs our life, our action, and our words. We'll talk more about prayer, about estates, about structures, about time. We've spoken of priorities. It changes our attitude to youth, the elderly, those at work, those on the edge, and 65 million others in this country. It changes every, everything. It, discipleship and evangelism embed in us the gift of the love of Christ, strengthening us in the ups and downs of life, enabling us to be comforted in sorrow and preparing us for death and glory. Discipleship and evangelism lead us into communities of worship. I'm so grateful to Father Thomas for emphasizing that and putting it at the top of the amendments. And our discipleship is influenced by our witness. Can't see me light. Our discipleship is influenced by our witness. To tell leads us to grow. It leads us to grow in faith, confidence, and worship. We see that when Jesus sends out the disciples. They come back with a whole new idea 
of what it means to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. So when we talk of evangelism and discipleship, we are talking about a radically differently shaped church, which starts with being filled afresh with the Spirit of God, consumed with the love of God for us, for the world, and obsessed by the vision of God of the world, which we seek to change, to show the shape of his love. Uh, Rachel Mann, followed by Angus Maclay, please. Three minutes still. Rachel Mann, Manchester 172. Thank you, Chair, for inviting me to speak into this pressing and exciting subject. I welcome this report as someone who's long argued that the church needs to recover the language of evangelism as the work of the priesthood of all believers. And I especially want to welcome this report as providing in its six priorities a series of challenges that interrogate those like me who in some quarters might be written off as flimsy progressives or liberal Catholics who refuse to grasp the urgency of the good news. Though there are moments when the report deploys terms which might strike some of you as inelegant, terms like envisioned or motivating our million, I hear the song this report seeks to sing. I readily appreciate what priority two, which speaks of releasing people as part of the whole people of God to live out the good news of Jesus' gestures towards. In our modest, in the modest, wondrous, often precarious church of which I'm rector, I've witnessed how an inclusive, searching and invitational culture has led to growth in numbers and depth especially at the younger end of the congregation. As, young, as one younger member said to me recently, St. Nick's is a place where one may turn to the person on the right and hear stories of old Manchester and then turn left to hear someone's hot take on Foucault. <laughs> Our fellowship is often precarious and perhaps it is so called to be. But in its sometimes clumsy, always joyful way, we have begun in Eucharist, in discipleship, our theology groups, to equip each other to live out the good news of Jesus. This is where I do wish to strike a modest note of caution. I should be alarmed if the somewhat programmatic language of this report was read in a reductive, prescriptive way, without the suppleness characteristic of Anglicanism at its best. Communities like those I serve have Christ absolutely at their center in word and table. The body of Christ is the locus of our embodied stories and lives. There is a generosity in orthodoxy which allows persons to locate their complex real lives in Christ's defining story. One size will not fit all. And I could see how this report might mistakenly be read as about creating followers of Christ's agents of grace who are supposed to be packaged mini-me's or Anglican Borg. Do not... <laughs> Be alarmed by what this report says. To be a seven-day disciple does not exclude space, grace, glory, and mystery. Thank you. Uh, after Angus Maclay, Mark Mervyn from Maiden Speech, please. Angus Maclay, Rochester 200. I wish to speak to the paragraph relating to the issue of developing confidence in our faith. Uh, there are plenty of anecdotes that I can share from my current church experience, but I want to build on how scripture tackles this issue by using 1 Peter, which has been referred to at a number of points within this group of sessions. 
Uh, 1 Peter 2, verses 9 to 12, stands at the hinge of this significant letter, linking the first main section and the second. The first section focuses on the enormous privileges, both future and present, which are enjoyed by God's people through the glorious gospel. As a result, Peter can conclude that we are a chosen people, a royal priest of a holy nation, God's special possession. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Peter wants us to be reminded of these staggering privileges which have significantly changed our identity. What a transition to celebrate. But as a result, he is able to say that our new purpose is that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. In other words, a vision for all God's people being active in evangelism is based on the constant thrilling reminder of the way that our gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ has shaped and changed our own lives. But Peter does go further and immediately encourages believers with these words. Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. In other words, holiness, as was stressed in our morning Bible study and derived, uh, one Peter says, from Leviticus, is to be the mark of every believer's lifestyle. A church without an understanding of sin and without a passion for holiness will not be able to hold out this life-changing gospel with any integrity. And therefore, effective evangelism is certainly what we want. But it must be based on the faithful teaching of God's word to remind us what Christ has done for us. And it must be linked with a serious engagement with holiness, with the help of God's spirit. 1 Peter offers us a holistic vision for engaging our culture with the gospel, which should renew our confidence in this glorious work of evangelism wherever we are. Thank you, Sue. I hear a point of order. <laughs> I was hoping to squeeze in just one more after Mark Mervyn, uh, if uh, Miss Mary Bucknell is wishing to speak. Mark. Thank you. Mark Murphan, London 165. Thank you, Chair, for calling me. And thank you to the Evangelism Task Group for the report. I was, I've been looking forward to this debate since last, summer, since last summer, since we met in York, and hope to speak then after attending a, a fringe meeting that presented the results of, that were, of the Talking Jesus research and introduced the Talking Jesus course. And I'm really pleased that some of the findings from that research were included in the paper because, frankly, they're shocking. I mean, firstly, we have some incredible news that, by and large, people know churchgoers and they like us. There's... <laughs> shocking, isn't it? And yet 70% of us said that we knew someone we could invite to church, but 85 to 95% of us said we had no intention of doing so. 85 to 95% of those who knew someone they could invite to church said we had no intention of doing so. That's a scary thought. Now, I'm not reciting that stat to kind of bash us over the head, but we just need to be clear of, the, you know, of, of our starting position. And I'm sure that figure goes across all traditions. I'm, a, I'm an evangelical, I'm proud of that. And yet when I read that statistic, I think that's something I need to repent of. On the first day of Synod, um, the Archbishop of Canterbury asked if we would give up cynicism for Lent. And those words have played in my mind for a, a, for a while. I think I also need to give up my own self-confidence. And by that, I mean any confidence that I have in my own ability to bring about someone's conversion. 
I think that's why it's great that the report calls us to pray, to pray continually, to be dedicated in praying for five people to come and know the joy of sins forgiven in Jesus Christ. For this country to be evangelized again, we need to get that right sense of confidence. Of course, we really do need to be equipped, and we've never had as many resources as we do now to help us in that task. But we need confidence in something outside of ourselves. We need confidence in the power of the gospel to save. Because without that, we'll never go beyond superficial conversations with our friends and colleagues, conversations about something out there, some conversations about a big man up in the sky, conversations about the spiritual, but with no sense of the Holy Spirit of God. Synod, let's not be merely in for, better informed about evangelism, but let's be transformed again by the power of God's word to get over that awkwardness, to get over that pain barrier, and to talk about the eternal things of life. Thank you. Mary Bucknell, after which I will be seeking to bring things to a conclusion. Mary. Mary Bucknell, this Anglican together, 469. Mr Chairman, I wish to draw the attention of Synod members to the needs of profoundly deaf, lay and ordained people. Item 12C. They are unable to access standard evangelism and discipleship materials produced by dioceses and theological education institutions without British Sign Language interpretation and or subtitles. I am a member of Deaf Anglican Together with my own experience of deafness and isolation this causes. With permission, I would like to raise the following points. One, there are currently no theological courses aimed specifically at deaf people in British Sign Language. Previously, there was a church's certificate in Christian ministry in partnership with the University of Chester, but this proved too expensive to run. Two, there are large annual conferences, such as New Rhine and Spring Harbour, with British Sign Language interpretation and a deaf swing, but these are one-off events. Three, currently, there are 17 dioceses out of 42 without a deaf chaplain, ordained minister, or a licensed lay minister working with deaf people. Number four, training for authorised ministers is hearing run with sign language interpreters, but this is not the answer. The cost of funding interpreters also raises the question, who pays? Number five, services in British Sign Language are usually held only once a month in deaf churches. Number six, there is a wide variety of online resources for evangelism and discipleship, some of which are subtitled. For example, the Pilgrim Court. There is also British Sign Language translation of some materials in Christianity Explored. This is to be commended, but it is disappointing that the new Bible Society Court has videos which are not subtitled. If profoundly deaf, lay and ordained people do not hear, how can they pass on the gospel message to others, including deaf people who may be in even greater need? As a past theological student myself, I long to see more in-depth Bible training, which is accessible to deaf students, to counteract their sense of isolation and lack of fellowship with other Christians so that they can realise their potential and become effective witnesses for Christ in the world. Thank you.
as there are people still standing, I'm going to have to put a motion for closure, uh, which I can now do as chair. So that as many as are in favour of a motion for closure, please show. Thank you. As many as are against, please show. That is clearly carried. So we move now to the final bits of the proceedings. I invite uh, Reverend Barry Hill to respond to the debate. He has up to five minutes. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Synod. Uh, inspiring at times, I think, uh, moving uh, debate and the challenges that we've heard from speaker after speaker of making sure that this uh, is not the start, but that it doesn't end here, that it spills out into the radical change and transformation of our church, of which a number of speakers uh, have mentioned. Um, particular thanks uh, to uh, Alison Coulter for reminding us we can't outsource this. This is the calling. It is our baptismal call. I'm reminded of the Bishop of Burnley. The prime sacrament of the church is baptism, and through that, all of us are witnesses, kind of, whether we like it or not. Um, and I was reminded, it felt a very helpful conversation, I think, one which I hope is echoed up and down the land in churches around what is the role of clergy and what is the role of the whole people of God um, in that. I was reminded of the beautiful words of the ordinal, which if you haven't read lately, particularly in reference to evangelism and witness, I would suggest we go back to in prayer regularly. And interestingly, on the section in evangelism and witness, it starts with the words, with all God's people. Uh, thank you also for mentioning thy kingdom have come, of which I think there will be a free gift possibly on your chairs as you return from lunch. Um, uh, and uh, as we saw in the research last year, uh, over 40% of those who prayed, um, that prayer led to them sharing faith more with others. When you pray, uh, move your feet. Uh, Andrew Lightbrown, thank you very much. I agree we could do with thickening this out. I'm reminded a little of the words of uh, St. Augustine, uh, it's solved by walking. And as we walk this out together, I don't think we can sort all the answers and then work it out, but as we walk it out, hopefully in God's grace, we can work it out. Uh, the importance of multi-faith, uh, I couldn't agree more. I was uh, struck, a few of us were talking this morning in my own family, I have uh, in close family, uh, Jewish, atheist, Muslim, and uh, Christian relatives. And actually, I often find it is those of other faiths who encourage me to share with them, what is this hope that you have in Christ? Uh, so um, uh, really very important indeed. The Bishop of Oxford and the Archbishop of Canterbury reminding us this is not a technical solution. There's not a sticking plaster that works for this. It is radical transformation of every Christian community. And dare I say, to allow ourselves to be radically transformed by those that God draws to us with the gifts and perspectives that they bring as well. It gives me the opportunity to highlight, as many have, uh, Bishop Stevens' uh, blog as well on this. Uh, to Carl uh, Wollstone uh, uh, Home, um, uh, the excitement, the joined up thinking with setting God's people free. I'm sure the chair of Ministry Council uh, has heard uh, comments there both about ordinands uh, that were made by you, by Philip Fleming, uh, and uh, also importantly, I think, by Mary Bucknell uh, towards the end as well. Um, the Bishop of Leicester, as I've seen uh, in, in Leicestershire, the difference that the time he's taken and others bishops have taken around the country in working with ordinands and with deacons and with the whole people of God in showing what this looks like and how we are um, transformed by this as a Monday to Saturday, not just a Sunday task. Uh, as an old theologian used to say of church on a Sunday morning, this is for that. The dismissal, the mass, the most important part, arguably, of our service. Rachel Mann, uh, I, I loved, I think some may have missed it at the end, the image of an Anglican Borg, which I'm sure we are keen to avoid, although it's the time of year where toy makers are thinking about what to put in the shops for Christmas, and I'm sure a number will take that idea away, I'm sure it will be popular, uh, but that sense, so important, of uh, there isn't one size that fits all, there's no cookie cutter solutions, um, uh, and so important, I think it was so helpful, I'm so grateful, of reminding us, um, it's not that all, tradi all traditions are needed in this because we have some bizarre theology of fairness, that if part A of the church gets to do it, then part B also needs a fair crack. We need this because we are parish people and we're set in parishes where God has called us to serve all of the people of this nation. And that is a diverse group and that needs the gifts of each tradition in order to do that. Um, so thank you for reminding us. Uh, Anglis Maclay, the gift of freedom, of salvation, of identity in Christ, touching again, as others have, that this will transform us. If we as Christians and as those we seek to serve and reach are not transformed, then we've missed something uh, fundamental. Mark Merthyn, uh, in Talking Jesus, 
Uh, people know us and they like us. It may be a surprise. Uh, we haven't got it all sorted, but we're not arriving at a party empty-handed. We have been given a gift, not of ours, uh, but of God's. And Mary Bucknell, uh, to finish, I think just a uh, profound and beautiful and challenge uh, in words to the church. How do we make sure that in our evangelism we embody the call of God that this is a gift for all, that God goes to those who feel they are forgotten and marginalized and ignored. Though he goes to God, those with hope and longing in their hearts and says, I see you and I love you and I need you and I call you. And that's what this is about, not technically agreeing to this words or that words in a report, but allowing ourselves to be changed by God. Thank you very much. I therefore put item uh, 12 to the vote as uh, if we must. <laughs> Stuart 5, Carl 07. I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman, but the, the, the text of the motion as it appeared on the screen a few moments ago did not include my amendment, which was passed. Ah. Can we just be clear what we're voting on? Uh, I can be very, I'm apologies for a breakdown in the AV system then, but it does. This is item 12 as amended by 42, 43, and 45, 45 being your amendment. Tim, is this another point of order? Again, Chair, on the, uh, the Tim Hyde of Bath and Mars 247, in the way in which the uh, amended motion appeared on the screen just now, it did not make sense because Father Thomas's amendment had not been uh, put in correctly. So it needs to have an A brackets in front of it uh, for it to make some sense. We will shoot the people who are running the, uh, the, the textual uh, <laughs> system. <laughs> the, what appears on the screen is illustrative. The definitive text is on your order papers as um, amended by the amendments in the wording put on the order papers. I therefore put this item, oh, <laughs> this is your dinner time. I'd really rather not, but if 25 members stand, we will have to have. Are there 25 members standing? There are. I see no 25 members standing. We therefore move to a show of hands. As many as are in favor, please show. As many as are against, please show that is clearly carried. <laughs> Synod, uh, we're about to go to lunch. Before we do, can I, on a personal note, thank you. This is the last time I'll be on the panel of chairs. I've thoroughly enjoyed working with you. You've made my life more interesting and exciting, especially with your points of order. Um, I look forward to making my own interventions from the floor uh, as obstreperously as I can in due course.